before I hand over to David, please bear in mind that the information presented is for general educational purposes only, and you should always seek your own personalised financial advice. David will also be answering your questions at the end, so please add them in the Q&A pop-up at the foot of the screen throughout, and we'll try to answer all of them uh, time permitting. I should also mention an hour after this session, David will be back for a panel session. So if you don't get your question answered now, uh, join again an hour later and David will be um, answering more questions there. So without further ado, over to you, David. Excellent. I appreciate uh, having me. I'll just share a very quick 60 second video, uh, just about just a quick introduction to um, Expat Financial, which is a division of THG Global. Hello there. Are you going global? If so, it makes sense to obtain insurance that will cover you and your family members globally. Expat Financial is an independent international brokerage that offers international health insurance, expatriate life and disability insurance, as well as travel insurance plans to both individual expatriates and expatriate employers. Expat Financial connects clients around the world with well-known and respected insurance service providers while providing excellent client support and service. Individual expats can also obtain a quote and apply for international health insurance coverage via expatfinancial.com. Expat Financial, a division of TFG Global Insurance Solutions LTD, can also source special risk coverage for employees working in high-risk countries. Please contact Expat Financial today to discuss your global insurance needs. Remember, Expat Financial is your go-to expatriate insurance specialist. Thanks for watching and bye for now. All right, so I'll just uh, start the presentation. Okay, so start again. Again, we're going to do a quick uh, presentation on the global health insurance considerations for, and solutions for American expats, but we'll also talk a bit about um, some other you know, insurance products that some American expats get as well, such as life and disability coverage. Uh, so just, I've already given the introduction on expat financial, uh, which is a division of TFG Global. Um, basically, I've, we've been a leader in providing international health insurance solutions and expatriate life and disability coverage um, for um, expatriates around the globe. We're basically an insurance brokerage. We don't charge a consulting fee. And we, in terms of the insurance products we sell, we're not an insurance company. We're just an agent. Um, but we don't charge any fees to our clients um, and work as their advocate and their independent uh, broker or an agent for you know, international insurance plans as expats. Um, it's the same premiums, whether you use this or not, and all the premiums are always payable and claims payable direct with the insurers. Uh, just a bit about me. Again, I've been in the business, insurance business since uh, 1991. Um, and uh, we operate, for, you know, our main specialty is global health insurance coverage for as well as expat life and disability coverage for individual expats, as well as uh, for um, uh, companies that employ expats. We're located in uh, Vancouver and Toronto, Canada. Um, we've been interviewed extensively and written extensively on expat related issues. Um, and we operate the websites expatfinancial.com and TFG Global and a few others, but our primary one is expatfinancial.com. You can see our contact information below. So who buys a, a global health insurance plan? Basically, there would be people who are obviously living abroad for extended travel or retirement. So global nomads, expats, digital nomads, global citizens. And these are generally people that are spending at least six months abroad um, outside their country of citizenship because these global health plans are not for local nationals, they're for expatriates. So generally, the insurers want to make sure that you're spending at least that six months outside of, of, uh, of your country citizenship. Otherwise, they they expect you to go onto a, a local a local health plan. Um, 
again, and related to that, global health insurance can't cover Americans who are residing in the U.S. for more than six months. So again, these policies, you have to generally provide an address um, outside of, of the U.S. to, to get the coverage. Um, and you have the coverage, if you do move back to the U.S., um, which of course a lot of expats do, um, and you're going to spend more than six months there, then the plan will not be renewable for pretty much all the global health insurance plans that I've seen in the market. So why do American expats buy global health insurance coverage? Well, aside from you know, a few obvious things, but basically because they're living abroad and US healthcare or Medicare won't cover them. Um, also, obviously, to preserve their finances should they experience a, a medical you know, emergency or accident or illness. Uh, generally, as well, local health plans um, at a lot of expat destinations are not available to, uh, to expats or they're not very desirable. Um, and what's come up over the past few years, even more so, especially with COVID, um, is that a lot of uh, expats are getting global health insurance to, in order to get a visa in their destination, such as going to Portugal, Italy, Thailand, and quite a few others. So a lot of these, these countries are saying, I don't want people coming here with no coverage. Um, we wanna make sure that they at least get some coverage, either local, um, which will be probably very, very basic and you may not wanna get it uh, for a lot of reasons, or you, you know, provide some sort of proof that you have a global health insurance policy. And they may want as well a, a plan that will cover them not only in their destination country, but uh, it will cover them regionally, also back home in the United States or in, in wherever they would want to get uh, medical treatment. Um, and as well, I mean, if a lot of expats and global nomads want a expat health plan that is portable. So if they go to uh, Thailand, maybe for a year or two, they move to another country. If they bought a local plan, now they have to reapply for another plan, maybe a local plan in Cambodia or Vietnam or Australia. Uh, and if they've developed a pre-existing medical condition in the meantime, that local plan that they bought just covering them for Thailand, for example, is no longer, you know, you know they're gonna have to reapply for a global plan. And if they, in, in you know, bad health, it might be a, certainly a, uh, an issue for them getting coverage. So um, how are the premiums determined? Uh, well, a lot of the obvious ones, but again, age, citizenship, coverage area. Again, the U.S. having, um, again, usually these policies are global, excluding the U.S. or including the U.S. Um, adding the U.S. care will certainly add, um, you know, potentially 40, 50 percent for non-U.S. expats. But depending on the policy, some of them will, it might only cost you an extra 20 percent, 10, 20 percent for adding US care. I would find most American expats will want a policy that includes the US, but probably about half of them, you know, or a little less than half will just say, no, I don't, I don't need coverage in the United States. I don't wanna pay the extra, I don't need it. Or maybe I'm covered very, by Medicare there if they're over 65. Um, obviously the coverage level, most of these policies have two or three ranges, like a basic mid-range deluxe, uh, the deductible level, you know, deductible is basically what you pay before the insurance kicks in. So the higher the deductible, the more risk you're willing to take, um, more the financial obligation for a claim. Um, so if some people want a very big deductible because they just want to self-insure, they don't want, um, uh, you know, they want to lower the premium essentially. Sometimes gender, but more often not. Uh, obviously, the options that you choose will have a big impact. A lot of people uh, will just get hospital coverage. Um, so inpatient hospital coverage, they don't want to worry about outpatient care, where, which might be very inexpensive in the expat destination that they're in. Obviously, the insurer you choose and whether you're an individual or part of a group plan. But again, our talk is primarily today about individual expats. So what's included in these plans? Well. Um, Generally, the base coverage is inpatient hospital coverage. So that would relate to, I'm not gonna hold list, but basically care that's done inside a hospital. So it could be cancer care, um, accident emergency room treatment, um, 
your, your medication in the hospital, uh, palliative care, cancer care, um, transplants, uh, some, some of the plans will cover treatment for obesity, um, congenital uh, you know, conditions, that type of thing. Outpatient care uh, is basically, as it sounds, uh, treatment outside a hospital. And that'll be things such as uh, uh, telehealth, uh, prescribed drugs and dressings, uh, pathology, radiology, diagnostic tests, MRIs, CT scans outside a hospital, rehabilitation, physio, uh, going to see a doctor or specialist outside a hospital, uh, some cancer screening as well. And then um, it also should include, I guess, yeah, adult vaccinations, dental accidents, that type of thing. Uh, the other option would be wellness, which is basically, as it sounds, getting um, going for checkups with a doctor, doing some preventative um, care, uh, breast cancer screening, bowel screening, lung cancer screening, um, prostate cancer screening, those types of things. Um, another one, obviously, is important is medical evacuation. Um, we find a lot of expats who are in, um, you know, especially in developing countries with limited medical care. Well, should definitely get medical evacuation coverage. And that is where you, you can't be treated in the uh, local country that you're in. So you are, um, you are, you don't need to be a medically evacuated to a country nearby. Um, but they, that, those medical evacuations always have, always have to be approved and organized by the insurer. Uh, then there's dental and vision. More often than not, we see a lot of expats don't get this option, though, especially if they're in a if they're paying the premium, they don't have an employer paying the premium, uh, because a lot of those, a lot of that kind of uh, work can be done locally for fairly inexpensive uh, cost. Uh, maternity coverage uh, in some plans, it's offered uh, usually after a twelve, well, always after a twelve-month waiting period for individual policies. Um, and then telehealth is becoming really big, especially with the pandemic. Being able to uh, talk to a nurse, a practitioner, or a doctor. Um, it's very useful via your computer or, or phone. Um, again, how to lower uh, your premiums for global health care. Again, we talked a bit about deductible. Um, sometimes if you ask for a discount or at least with our main provider that we use, they will offer all our clients some sort of discount. Um, if you pay your premium manually, you'll save about 10%. So if you can do it, I definitely recommend that. Um, Get a hospital-only plan. Um, that definitely reduces your premium substantially if you want to self-insure, essentially, outpatient care. And then otherwise, you can go with a lower level of coverage. Obviously, the other one that I name would be you know, getting a plan from a lesser provider. I don't recommend it, but some people do that to uh, lower the cost. All right, so common questions from American expats. Uh, will the insurance cover my pre-existing condition or conditions, I should say? I get this all the time. Um, there are some medical conditions that the insurers will cover, um, but there are also a whole bunch of others that they won't cover. Uh, that they, Generally, they will provide, if it's a plan, if it's a condition that they can't cover, um, could be a, like a back condition, which is going to pop up. You know, Once you've got a back condition, it's probably going to pop up again and again. Most of the expat insurers will exclude it. Um, if you have a condition which is, you know, obviously very serious, the, there is obviously the chance that you might be declined for coverage. It's unfortunate, but it's an individual policy, so it's so the underwriting is individual and it's based on your on your health. Um, should I get a plan that includes the U.S.? Um, I would say for most expat U.S. expats, they will want to do this, but it's really up to you. I would say that if you are in an expat destination such as the Caribbean or maybe Mexico um, or maybe uh, South America, where, you know, depending where you are, the country, region where the medical care is not that great and you might need to be medically evacuated, it's probably a good idea to get US coverage if you can handle it, handle the, the extra cost. Because, for example, if you're in Bahamas, you're more than likely to be evacuated to Miami. So you're gonna want a plan that covers uh, you in the US. How to make a claim, broad statement, but basically uh, a lot of these policies will allow you to uh, submit the, you know, smaller claims uh, via your phone um, or uh, via your computer, you just scan it, send it in. 
if it's if you're going to a hospital, you are generally going to want to someone's going to want to basically uh, contact the insurer, um, request a guarantee of payment uh, to that hospital, or if you can go to a place where that is in their medical network for the for the insurance provider. Um, you should be able to show your card. That'll provide, they'll contact the insurer and make sure you are covered um, and you won't have to pay out of pocket. Um, the, I, you know, it's very key to go with a, a provider that will cover you um, globally and has a very large and robust medical network. The more established providers have the best medical networks generally. But again, there's a lot of facilities, especially in developing countries, which just don't want to deal with an insurance company. So you might have to pay uh, out of pocket and submit it. Or again, again, the, hopefully the worst case scenario is that you can request a guarantee of payment from the insurer and hopefully the hospital will accept that. Another question we get as well from a lot of uh, you know, more, uh, older expats is will this plan cover me for life? Depends on the provider. Uh, some can cover you for life. Um, some can't. They'll uh, kick you off at 75 or 85 or what have you. But again, as you would expect, these premiums do increase with age. Um, and you also, they also increase with uh, inflationary increases, um, which is a, you know, skipping down a point, generally, which runs around 9, 9 to 12% per year, unfortunately. But yeah, insurance, in health insurance inflation has always been high, even before general inflation. Um, the question, like how much will it cost? Again, really depends on a lot of factors. I do have a sample quote later in the presentation. Um, should I get a local plan? Really up to you. Um, if you're in a place where it has universal health care, you're in poor health, probably your best bet. Um, if you want a plan that is, again, global, which is what most expats want, um, and again, we talked about being able to have portability, being able to get medical care regionally, um, you know, through private care back in your home country, you're probably going to want to get an expat plan. There's a lot of advantages to it. Usually more often than not, it's probably going to be more money, but that is what it is. Um, is there a cost going via us? As I noted, there's no extra cost. It's the same premium regardless. Uh, last one, uh, our expat plans. Cobra or ACA compliant? No, they're offshore global health plans, which are not for uh, Americans residing in the US. They are uh, for expats only. How do you buy expat health coverage? Well, we like to make it easy. Um, you can get it via our website, Expat Financial, or contact us via email, chat, phone, to discuss your requirements. Um, you can apply if you are already abroad, no problem. Um, but obviously, you have to be in OK Health uh, to get approved by the insurers. Um, most expat insurers won't let you apply if you're in your, your um, home country um, until you're at least 45 days out from moving abroad or already, again, as I noted, already living abroad. But they'll allow you to get a quote, and you can always save the quote um, a you know, year in advance or if you want, and then reactivate it later on. Uh, so here's a sample quote for a 45 year old uh, living in sunny Italy. So as you can see, they have three levels of coverage in this particular insurer, which is silver, gold, and platinum. Um, so again, obviously your platinum would have the highest levels of coverage with the highest maximums. Um, your gold plan would be kind of mid-range would cover you know maternity coverage. Um, and you can see some of the, uh, again, you've got the silver plan, more of the base coverage, lower maximums. Um, and you can see like a silver, $185 a month. Uh, if you add the outpatient, that's about 136. I quoted them all with a zero deductible. Medical evacuation, because you're in Italy, it's very unlikely you're gonna need, need evacuation coverage. So the cost is pretty low. Health and well-being. There um, as well, the vision and dental, forty-six dollars for uh, the silver plan. U.S. coverage only added about ninety dollars to the cost, so that's pretty good. Um, for the platinum level, it added about one hundred and seventy. 
Um, and as you can see, if, again, if you pay annually, you should save you about 10%. Some of the expenditures we deal with, we have, I haven't listed them all, but uh, would be things like IMG, Geo Blue, Allianz, Now Health, Cigna, William Russell, uh, and there's quite a few others out there in the market. Um, I mean, probably my favorite would be Cigna, because um, I know they're you know very large global insurance company that I know is going to be around for forever. Um, very capable, and we have a lot of our corporate clients with them as well. Some final quick tips. Um, don't cancel existing coverage until you're sure your new plan is approved and paid and in place. Um, you know, we don't really recommend people switch insurers. There's always a risk to doing that. Um, so, you know, stick with a, you know, get a good coverage in place with a really reputable and um, a capable expat insurer. Um, because once you develop a pre-existing condition, or if you do, um, it's very, you know, unwise to switch to a new insurer. At the end of the day, you really do get what you pay for. I like to say to people, um, if it's a higher cost, there's probably a reason uh, for the most part. And as well as I already mentioned, get medical evacuation coverage in your, if you're in a in an expat destination, which has suspect uh, level of uh, medical care. Um, go, as I say, go with a record of a carrier that is there for the long run. When you apply, provide mo full medical history be as you know, clear and uh, concise as possible. Um, you definitely want to give them you know, the honest truth in terms of your medical history, um, because if you don't provide, if you admit a lot of stuff, then they can go back and say, you know, uh, cancel the policy. Um, what do I do if, you know, if I get a medical exclusion? You know, I have a medical exclusion on my disability plan, for example, for my back. Um, didn't mean I didn't want to take the policy. Um, I, it's one of those cases of not throwing out the baby with, with the bathwater. You know, if you can get the coverage, if you have an exclusion for something, it's not the end of the world, it's not ideal, but I'd still say, you know, you should get the, the coverage. Um, and if you, for if anyone who wants it, you can download our um, guide to buying international health insurance. It's got a lot of information, including the stuff I covered today, but a lot more. Uh, what about expat life and disability insurance? Um, yes, we can source those as well. There are limited options available. It's not a huge number of ex expat insurers that are that are do this kind of coverage. Um, and a lot of expats will get expat life and disability coverage because they maybe their um, plans back in the US don't cover them abroad um, or they just need more coverage. I mean, if you can keep your, your coverage back in the US, and it's not going to. It's still going to cover you abroad. Definitely keep it because uh, expat life insurance policies are going to be a lot more expensive than what you could have got back in the U.S. So, if you maybe if you're thinking of going abroad, you know, in five, ten years, get that coverage in place now. More than likely, it the insurers in the U.S. are not going to cancel it because you move abroad. For expat term life plans, that's basically what's mostly available that I've seen in the market. They're not going to do universal life or whole life. It's going to be term plans for 10, 20, 30 years max, usually to age 75, 80. Um, and they are, as, as well, they also have year to year plans that will go up with age every year, usually to age 65 for those, some of those plans. Um, disability coverage, so an often missed uh, coverage for a lot of American expats. Um, we uh, definitely recommend getting expat disability insurance if you are employed abroad and you're not covered by your expat employer or your local employer there. Because really, if you think about it, you're, one of your most important um, assets is your ability to earn income. And that a lot of people drive their independence uh, from being able to work. And if you're not being able to work because of a sickness or injury after a waiting period of usually 90 or 180 days, you're going to definitely want some disability coverage. So it's something that we can source for a lot of expats, depending on the occupation and where they're living. So um, that's it. I'll also stop sharing and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, David. That was excellent, short and sweet. Um, oh, hopefully. <laughs> I think you uh, got through a lot. So that's great. We've had some good questions come in. That's 
dive in. Um, so I think there are a couple of questions about, do you offer, is it possible to get expat insurance that covers specific dates or six months of the year for people who I guess are kind of, um, you know, spending part of their time in the US and part of their time abroad? Uh, not really. These, yeah, I should have noted that. Basically, the, these global health plans are annual. They're meant for people that are you know, getting coverage for at least a year. Um, if they're only going abroad for like a couple of months, maybe up to six months, more often than not, you want to keep your health coverage in the U.S. Uh, probably, uh, I mean, it's up to you. I'm not, I don't source U.S. coverage for Americans living in the U.S. that are going to be staying there um, and get travel medical insurance. And travel medical insurance is basically just covering emergencies for a set period of time, like going from May 1st to September 1st or you, you, for up to a year, actually. But those thing with travel medical insurance is that it's emergency only. So if you get a chronic condition, you, you know, cancer treatment, um, it's not for that. It's really just urgent medical care that is only covering you outside your country of citizenship. So I, I don't know if that, hopefully that answers your question. I think so. Yeah, there are a couple of other questions on that topic. Um, mm. So for, for example, digital nomads who, are, who kind of, again they, they're traveling between countries but maybe out of the us up to six months um i suppose they're looking for something in between the two the two types of insurance you just described something that will cover um all all, all illnesses and so on but um yeah i mean the, the, the travel, travel insurance really. yeah the travel medical insurance will cover injury and illness yeah. while you're abroad and we do offer some plans uh from some sources on that um, again, it can cover you. But again, if you are doing that, it's important to keep your medical care back in, in well, I assume in the US um, if you're getting travel medical insurance because um, the whole nature of travel medical insurance is for covering people for short periods of time. Uh, they, these plans will cover you globally outside of the US, essentially, for travel medical insurance. They're, med they're, they're okay to, you usually have to list one, your main destination. But if, you, if that is Italy, for example, that's still gonna cover you if you're going to Thailand as well on one big wide trip. Um, and then you can, you know, if you want to go back to the US, you can, re, you know, uh, get another uh, travel insurance plan for your next trip that might be a couple of months. Uh, but if you're very gonna be spending a good, you know, certainly a, a big portion of your time outside of the US, like more than six, seven, eight months, um, you're gonna have a, a, uh, some sort of residence uh, abroad, even if that is changing, then you probably want to want to get a, a global health plan, especially if you're going to lose your coverage back in the US because you're no longer a resident there. At least that's my, my general advice. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I think that covers uh, two or three of the questions. Um, another one is, this is a good one. Um, when you move abroad, you'll often, it takes a while before you qualify as a resident in your in your new country um at which point you can access local health care so there's a sort of limbo period or a period where where you're yeah. kind of stuck between the two things and so do you is sort of global health insurance that you've described a good solution to meet that gap it may be a, a sort of one to five years i suppose oh yeah depending on the yeah yeah sometimes it's three months sometimes it's a year sometimes it's several years yeah a lot of a lot of uh American expats and non-American expats will get a global health plan, um, especially if they're going to maybe Europe, for example, uh, where they do offer a lot of universal health care, which is usually pretty decent. Um, and they will get an expat health plan for a year or two or three. And then you really, you can cancel these policies anytime, um, you know, at renewal with no problems. Um, before the renewal, usually they will want the full premium uh, for that year, if you've been doing some decent amount of claiming, really depends on the insurer. But yeah, we get that all, all the time. If you're only, if you're going to be eligible in a few months, like three months, more than likely you just get a, a travel medical insurance plan to cover emergencies only. Um, if you if you have a short waiting period till you're on the uh, a domestic plan for, at your expat destination. Okay. Um, how to how to, how to, here's another question from Mary sure. Jo. How do these plans work with health savings accounts? 
Um, are you familiar with HSAs in the US? Um, uh, yeah, they're totally unconnected. These are fully insured um, uh, global health plans that are, yeah, they don't work with H HSAs, not that I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Because they're not, they're, yeah, they're, they're offshore policies only for, again, only for expats living abroad that provide an address outside uh, of the US. Yeah, so they don't, they don't work yeah. with HSA, not that I've seen at least. Okay, uh, this is a great question actually from uh, Cheryl. Uh, what constitutes a pre-existing condition in the sense of how far in the past should you go? Uh, Cheryl says, for example, if I had back problems in 2003, um, but I've not had problems since, should that be reported? I think that's interesting for all sorts of health insurance. Yeah. So, yeah. W what's the, how far back should you be thinking declaring for existing well, conditions? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, I would, you know, I go as far back as you, within, you know, as you can really, because it's, uh, it's a, I mean, there's a good chance for the back, if it's been that far back that they won't exclude it, but I'm thinking the problem with backs are tricky. They can, you know, like I have a sore back as well. Um, it hasn't been a problem for a few years, but I know it's, you know, at some point it'll pop up. Um, I would say you should provide as, you know, a full medical history. Um, when in doubt, just disclose everything you can, everything that's relevant, because if you don't disclose it and it pops up and they look back and, and you know, they contact your doctor for the medical history. They suspect it's a pre-existing condition, which is backs usually are <laughs> related to pre-existing uh, conditions. There is a chance you don't want to get in a situation where they're, you know, canceling your policy for non-disclosure. So, um, you know, it's one of the things you, you want to provide a full medical history. But when you do, you know, uh, we find a lot of people when they provide the medical history, they kind of leave big question marks. They don't really do provide the full story. So really for the underwriter, they're gonna assume the worst. So if you give a really good medical history, you know, there's been no treatment for you know, such and such a long time um, and paint the, the true story, but it's a full story, um, you know, there's a good chance it might be covered and you might not get excluded or a, a full decline. I've never seen someone be declined for a back uh, related issue. I guess if it's needing surgery, maybe, but those are easy for the insurers to exclude. I mean, if someone's had, you know, breast cancer, unfortunately, or some sort of cancer, you know, five, seven years ago, there's more than likely there, there's, unfortunately, it's going to be a decline, which I, as the broker, hate. But, um, you know, we fight for the insurer, for, not for the insurer, for the, for the uh, client on that as much as we can. But if it's been longer than that, it's not that serious a cancer. Maybe there's a good chance that it might be exclusion or they might cover it. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Um, are there any, um, Henry says, how do you get, can you get US term insurance if you live in France? I think there's a more general question there about does it, are there exclusions? Can you um, buy these policies wherever you live in the world at any time? Or do you, should you be thinking about this before you uh, move out of, move abroad? Well, see, so yeah, two questions. Yeah, if you're if you're living abroad, um, then you can. They, some we do get expats. Be in France, it could be depending on the country, but uh, for most countries, we can source expat term life insurance on a one you know on a yearly basis or like a 10, 20, 30 year max basis. Um, if they're in the U.S. and they're wanting a global life insurance or expat disability insurance policy, we can't source it. They have to be already living abroad for those plans um, because they're, they're offshore and they're, they just can't be purchased uh, from the US. Um, so, but yeah, it really depends. Uh, the, the, the rates for expat life insurance will generally depend on where you're living abroad. And there was always a few countries that um, the insurers might not be able to insure a person in for, for life, life or disability coverage. And the rates will depend on your, again, your age, gender, citizenship, where you're living, some of them even your educational background, um, obviously whether you're a smoker or non-smoker. Sure. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Um, oh, awesome. We're, yeah, so we're moving to France for a year on a one-way ticket. 
Um, nice. Would we, if we had, yeah, it does sound nice. If we, yeah. if we had the cover, would it, we return home in case of an emergency? Or, but I suppose, I'm guessing you'd be treated in the country where you, where the emergency happened with a global policy. Yeah, if they if they bought a global health plan, then it should cover them uh, in the expatriation destination. And again, these plans are almost all of them are uh, global, including or excluding the U.S. Um, so they could go back to the U.S. for medical treatment if they got a policy that included the U.S. Um, if they're going to go back permanently, then there's you know again with these plans, they're not renewable. If you uh, if you're an American and you move back to the U.S. permanently, and you're going to be spending more than six months there because they're not they're not for local um, U.S. nationals in the U.S. But yeah, you could be treated in you could go to uh, you'd be treated in for that person. They could be treated in France or they could go to England. Um, and they choose and with these plans, you have free yeah. choice of hospitals. You uh, all the plans that I've seen, you can go to whatever hospital that you want, uh, especially globally. With some of the plans, if you go, if you're getting treated in the U.S., um, they uh, it's a little more in your favor if you go within their network. Um, and some of the expat insurers have a very uh, large medical network in the U.S., um, so it shouldn't be a problem. So they might have a little less coinsurance, for example, uh, for treatment in the U.S. Because as you can guess, where is the most expensive place for medical treatment? It's the U.S. But I should say there are some countries where it's you know equally expensive or close to it would be, for example, China, Hong Kong, Singapore. Uh, for example, those are even the U.K. Uh, are very expensive places to seek medical treatment. So if you're you, an expat in Hong Kong or China or some of these expensive destinations, you should expect your um, expat health plan premiums to be higher than if you're in Italy or in Denmark, for example. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that's really interesting. So if you were in, for example, France and, and you needed uh, treatment, um, you, could, you could choose to have that treatment in the US if you had coverage, including the US, and yes. fly back in this, which may be preferable because it's On your own power. Yeah. Most, uh, this one thing I should have mentioned is that a lot of the plans that exclude treatment in the U.S. will allow for, if you're going back to the U.S. for like a couple of weeks, for example, uh, they'll allow emergency coverage when you're there. You won't be able to seek treatment there for chronic conditions or checkups and cancer care, that thing. But if you run into an urgent, um, uh, unexpected emergency or illness, some sort, uh, they will generally cover you in the U.S. Uh, if you, you know, for up to a certain number of days per, per year. Again, depends on the provider. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on to a different question. Um, oh, great. Anonymous attendee says, I'm a US citizen living in Canada for 40 plus years, also a Canadian citizen. Um, my understanding is that getting a Canadian life insurance policy is prob problematic for US citizens because of various IRS and other rules. Um, is that the case? Have you heard of that? Um, I haven't. Uh, now, I'm again. I'm not an ex expat tax or legal advisor. Um, I haven't. I haven't heard of that. I'm. I mean, if you're in a place like an expat living in Canada, you you should. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to source a um, global expat policy for you. And Canada's one of those countries we can't do it in for expats. Uh, but you're you're definitely more uh, in your interest to get a, a Canadian policy. If you're an expat in Canada for uh, term life insurance or disability insurance, um, that's definitely because the rates are going to be dramatically lower. And really, I can't sell an expat um, life or disability plan for uh, an expat in, in Canada. It's one of those countries we can't do it in. So, Americans so, in, but, in living in expats in Canada can't access these. That's interesting. They would yeah, they really have to talk to a local yeah. um, life insurance advisor and hopefully see if they can get a, a plan that will cover them. Um, I, I, I'd be surprised to, as, as you say, I'm, if you haven't heard of those, uh, of, of US citizens not being able to access life insurance. I think there are issues more, you hear more about issues um, accessing financial products, investments. and, and Yeah, I could see investments products. for sure. I think if you're doing term, it, it should be an issue because there's no cash value. But I think, yeah, I think it was an American, ex, American citizen in, um canada for a long period of time like that 
you know, I could see because if they're trying to get like universal life or whole life, where it, which has cash values and investments, yeah, it might. I could see why why the insurers would be uh, a little uh, leery of doing it. Oh, okay, again, it's not my bailiwick. And then the solution is to to look to local Canadian. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a good question though. I, I'm not, I'm not yeah, that one for. Yeah um okay and uh so are there which other countries uh can't you provide the global expat uh, insurance policy for out of curiosity are there any i mean canada there are a lot of americans um probably i think the most outside of the us but uh are you, are you asking for life insurance or uh or for, or for, for i think you said oh could uh when you said you couldn't provide policies is that just life or health as well to expats uh, there's a few i mean obviously if it's a war-torn country um it can be a little tricky. Um, I mean, there's all a lot of the expat insurers that they will have some countries that they don't won't provide coverage in, um, and for whatever reason, for lots of different reasons. So we just go to a different insurer that will. Um, obviously, if you're in like North Korea or you're in Syria or you're in, you know, somewhere else like that, or like Cuba can be potentially an issue depending on the insurer. Well, what about um, Russia, so, Russia at the moment? Because I know. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. It. Um, yeah, that would be in a country which has um, sanctions. It would be probably very, you know, be very difficult to get coverage there. I know, and uh, they might cover you there. It just really depends on the insurer. But they have to definitely comply with uh, with the uh, sanctions rules. And I certainly, I think in Russia, my understanding for any expats there that for for life insurance, I would say impossible. Um, for health insurance, it would be they wouldn't be able to reimburse hospitals there or certain bank accounts. So it'd be certainly very tricky. Yeah, yeah. if it's a sanctioned country. Yeah, I mean, so like Iran would be, for example. Uh, I've never covered any expats there. Probably a big reason is, you know, sanctions rules and things like that. Um, so. Okay, uh, Michael asks. Um, you gave an example of premiums for a forty-five-year-old. Uh, are they comparatively, could you give approximate rates for a 65 year old? Are they kind of double the 45 year old or, or, or is it, is it able to, are you able to give an approximation that way for Michael? Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, sure. I'd love to do that for you. So 65 year old where? American? American, we don't know where. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. So I suppose the uh, same scenario as the example of the 45 year old, just to, you know, very oh, generally. Let's just say Italy did. Yeah. Everyone's going to be able to these days. Um, very popular. Um, I think just very generally. I think uh, I don't think he wants a life quote or anything like that. But no, uh, no, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> so comparison. yeah, so a, a a silver plan would be for that, assuming zero deductibles. Um, just the hospital coverage would be like three hundred seventy US a month. Uh, if you add outpatient care. Um, you probably don't need evac, probably don't need vision or dental. You're looking around $663 for a silver plan um, for um, a mid-range plan. It could be like $959 a month. Um, and then their you know, deluxe plan, which has almost no limits on most care. Um, you'd be looking at $1248. But again, that's pre-discount. More than likely, our this particular insurer with us is going to provide a five or ten percent discount if you do a deductible. Um, depending on the country and your age, it may make little or no difference, um, and it, that can reduce your premium as well. And again, a lot of people will if if they're going to a place which has really cheap, you know, going to see a doctor, prescriptions, that type of thing, they might just say, "Heck it," and I'll just go with. Uh, um, hospital only, and we see a lot of people do that. Uh, or if they're in a country like, um, maybe they're going to Cambodia, which I'd love to go to at some point. Um, yeah, so same pl same plan. Actually, a little, it's more money. Um, it's about four ninety seven for silver. Policy for that uh, for a 65 year old, um, and evacuation, as you can guess, is about 186 dollars extra per month. 
over because more than likely there's a good chance that you might need to be medically evacuated um, for that. Uh, if, you know, if I think you're in a place um, which has suspect medical care. I was going to say, I'm sure there are lots of uh, fairly sort of, yeah, I mean, questions like that just drop David. Uh, yeah, uh, we can ensure like with there, yeah. like this one particular insurer, you could be an 85 year old or 90 year old. You can, as long as you're in okay health, you can still get the coverage. So, whereas well, that, a lot of some means... expat providers, they will right. only cover you up to age 69 for new applications. They might cover you after that for life, or they might um, only, you know, the coverage might cease at 75, but we do have some providers which can cover basically any age, age group and will cover you for life as long as you remain an expat. That leads on nicely. Um, Cindy asks, do, do global life insurance policies require a medical exam or testing? Oh, good question. Um, generally, they, if you're going for a decent amount of, you know, fair amount of coverage, I mean, the higher the amount of coverage, the more testing that they will want. Um, if it's a fairly low amount, they might only require a medical questionnaire, maybe a blood test. But if it's a fairly large amount, um, for expat life coverage or disability coverage, they're probably going to want uh, a bunch of medical testing as well as a, uh, a doctor's medical exam. Um, usually a Western trained or at least someone, a doctor that can, that can do the report in English. And those reports and testings are usually reimbursed by the expat life insurer. But for, and I should answer the same question, if they're doing health insurance, they, I've never seen a plan which is, you know, wanting you to uh, get a medical test, for example. They're going to have a bunch of medical questions, um, and if they have questions on the answers you've given, they might request a, a report from your doctor or for you to get it, uh, some details from your doctor or maybe a, a more detailed medical questionnaire for diabetes, for example, or back pain or what have you. So hopefully that answers that question. That's great, yeah. Um, Mary Jo asks, uh, if, if you help source the policy and we have problems getting a, pay, a claim paid, uh, would you intervene? Yes, we do. And we do, you know, do this on occasion for clients. Um, we had one recently where we had a client that uh, got prostate cancer. Now, this person had an enlarged prostate condition, I forget what you call it, uh, but it wasn't related to um, having, you didn't have prostate cancer, but he had enlarged. Um, there's a condition for that. And so he had an, ex he declared it, he had an exclusion on it. And I was really worried. I mean, in terms of the exclusion, I was really worried that he was going to get, because unfortunately he developed not that long after um, a uh, uh, prostate cancer and he had to get pretty expensive treatment in the UK. Um, and uh, the expat insurer in question, which is a really good one, they kind of looked at exclusion and said, no, we're not going to cover it. Um, so he was obviously um, uh, rather concerned, as he should be. Um, uh, but we, you know, we went to bat for him in that case, um, got him to provide a whole bunch of medical information, including the doctor's reports. Um, and so we used our poll and we were able, we were able in, in the end to get uh, the um, expat insurer to fully cover uh, the prostate surgery, biopsy, and treatment. So he was very happy. Um, that's one example. Um, you know, we like to play, place um, um, our clients with the most reputable providers as possible because we're going to have uh, our reasoning is that we're not going to have as many problems in the future. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, they're insurance companies and, you know, they're not, they don't cover everything. Um, there are exclusions on these policies for certain um, treatments, like, you know, someone getting, um, uh, you know, cosmetic treatment, that type of thing. So you, we will, go, as I said, short answer, yes, we'll go to bat for you if you're having, you know, getting into a, a tussle with the uh, insurance provider. That's part of our role. That's great. Um, so Don says, I'm 72. Can I keep my Medicare and Blue Shield supplement and get additional health insurance for Schengen countries? Global nomad, three to six months. Dual citizen, US Italian. Oh, that's a tricky um, one. I mean, I can't really comment on, on US coverage where they could continue. Not. I, 
Um, my understanding is they probably can, but I, I couldn't really answer that. But they can, if they are have a residence abroad, in, like in Italy, for example, I think in this gentleman's case, um, then, and they can provide an address there and they're spending more, you know, well more than six months outside of the US, then they can totally get an expat policy um, through uh, this particular uh, provider. Um, and again, that, they might just get the basic coverage that will satisfy those requirements. Because a lot of countries will have a requirement where they just want you to have basic hospital care. Some will want outpatient care. Some will even want, I think even Spain, I think is one of them. They want a policy that has a zero deductible for some reason, and maybe even medical evacuation. So um, really depends on, on, the, uh, on the country um, that, uh, you're, that, you're, that you're locating to what the requirements are. And they seem to change by the, you know, by the month or year. Um, there's a great track. question. Um, yeah, sure. Sorry, there's a great question from Julia. Um, oh, are there hi, policies Julia. for students studying abroad, say in Europe? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're a student abroad, um, then you there's you might get a travel insurance, but really probably a best bet because you're probably spending more than six months abroad. Um, you might want to get a, a global expat health plan. I mean, they might cover you under a, a university plan and it might be perfectly fine, but more than likely that university, that domestic plan in Europe, for example, won't cover you back in the US. So you might want to get an expat health plan or it might just be emergency only. Um, so yeah, it's certainly possible. This question, so you mentioned, um, for example, somebody in Latin America, uh, would want probably evacuating in the case of an emergency. Now, if they didn't have US um, included, what do they do? Do they sort of just choose or, or pick somewhere or does evacuation sort of automatically the nearest place or how does it work? It would probably, yeah, they're, they're going to look at your policy, I would hope, and not evacuate you to the US if you don't have coverage there. They're going to evacuate you to the nearest center of medical excellence that should be able to provide that medical care. You know, it might be Panama, for example. I mean, to Colombia has very good medical care, um, but if you're in like Venezuela, you know, probably not the greatest medical care there. You'd probably be medically evacuated uh, to Colombia. But where you are evacuated is really up. It's up to the insurer in the situation. In that in that case, it's really difficult to provide um, hypothetical um, and, you know, answers to hypotheticals on that. Yeah. Um... Are they, I think you already covered this one, I think, but there are the, the plans of global other than countries that, or do, do you specify countries when you purchase the, the expat insurance or health insurance? Oh, good or, question. Yeah. So yeah, when you're getting a quote, you'll, you're going to um, list the main country that you're going to be residing in. Um, but uh, so that, because the rates do depend on where you are. And at renewal, they're going to ask like, or have you moved to a different country, for example? Because the yeah, renewal rate will be based on on your expat destination, um, and uh, but again, you, these policies are almost always global, excluding the U.S. or um, including the U.S. I mean, we do have one provider that has an Africa-only plan, so you can do Africa global, excluding the U.S. or global including the U.S. Um, but th that's kind of an exception to have a. A geographic area, but again, the one particular insurer I should mention that we has a, a, a much more, even more basic plan for people that you know want the most affordable coverage, and in that case, that provider uh, will plan will cover you just in your home country, in your destination country, and your home country. Um, so if you're a UK expat and you're going to be in uh, Botswana. It's going to cover you just in Botswana and just in the UK. But if you're an American for this particular, it's called close care, uh, they're only going to cover you for that particular policy in the expat destination country. They won't cover you back in the US. Um, but again, because the premiums are and the coverage is quite basic, still pretty good, but quite basic. So uh, that was, uh, yeah, very good question. Yeah. 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 So what's uh, for a digital nomad, for example, who's uh, 
and I think there's a lot after the you know after the pandemic of people looking to working remotely now and looking to travel at the same time. Um, mm. And so, what if they don't have a kind of a home country, as it were, if they're constantly leading a nomadic international lifestyle? Uh, oh, I know. I know. I wish I wish I could be a digital nomad today. <laughs> That's um, a, a nice idea. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's always a bit tricky. They, I mean, if they if they are a digital nomad or class expat, what do you want to call it? But they are living abroad. Um, they have to really for the expat insurers. They have to. You just have to list the main country that you're going to be in, that you think you're going to be in the most time, and they'll go from that. Um, so that's, uh, um, but they, they, they're they fine with you moving to a different country. And then at renewal, you just say, well, here's where I think I'm going to spend, um, you know, the majority of my time. And hopefully you can provide some sort of virtual address or friend's address or in that uh, destination, because they need to, uh, to have something to prove. And, they're generally going to want to copy your passport and they just want to make sure that you are, you're going to be an expat and not, uh, you know, a local national because these plans are not for local, local nationals.